The views and opinions heard on this show do not necessarily reflect the views of the host. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Real Spiritual Talk Radio. My breathing had stopped for so long that my heart actually ended up stopping. He saw what I did and said that, that I was going to die. And then I remember being gone. I wasn't there anymore. I sort of lifted up about six feet above my body. A pinprick of light appeared and came rushing toward me faster than the speed of light. And then this light, all of a sudden it was all completely around me. He says, I am God. Yes, I am real. The main message was loving yourself and loving others. It was clearly shown to me. It was really hard to put into words. It felt like I had been there before. It was just this very personal, impersonal, unconditional love. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of Real Spiritual Talk Radio. I am your host, Lamont Gates, bringing you the world of faith, metaphysicality, and spirituality. Today, my guest shares with us a rather dark experience, one that leaves many questions to be answered, but in turn, still seemingly bringing a level of strength. Let's get it started. Ladies and gentlemen, joining me via telephone is near-death experiencer, Alicia Odell. Alicia, welcome to Real Spiritual Talk Radio. Hi, thank you so much. Glad to have you here. Now, I understand your account is an outlier, much different from typical near-death experiences. In fact, you go as far as calling it a hellish experience, correct? I would, yeah. Fascinating. And let me state that a hellish near-death experience will be the first of its kind on this show. Nonetheless, it does add to the literature and provides a different angle on the spectrum of experiences in general. So before we get into your account, why don't you tell us how you were introduced to the topic of religion or spirituality as a child, if it applies? Interestingly enough, I was raised uh, very close to a religious upbringing, so going to church um, very regularly um, in the middle of the week and in the afternoons and evenings, and constantly being aware of God. Was there a particular denomination you were affiliated with? Um, I was raised Baptist. Okay, Baptist, Protestant. Now you say you were near to God, so I'm supposing this played an important role in your life. Well, it did. Uh, regardless of the fact that my family did go to church, it was a very negative uh, environment. And um, it was a lot of abuse and um, a lot of dysfunction. I did pray to God a lot for help. When you say negative environment, are you referring to your home life? Yes. So you had no other, in your view, to turn to but God, hoping for some sort of change in this environment. Right. Okay, so let's get into your experience. How old were you when this experience occurred? Well, I had just had my 22nd birthday a week before, maybe it was two weeks before, and so that's how old I was. What was it that led up to the experience itself? So what happened to me was I was stabbed in the back with a dagger, and... Basically, I bled to death. I was stabbed in the kidney, stomach, and intestines, and it was murder. And so, obviously, I lived, but I believe what happened was I was given a 2% chance to live. So, that's when I had an NDE experience. So, you were stabbed in the back, taken to the hospital, I suppose, and given a 2% chance to live. Did you know who your attacker was? I do. Yeah, it was a very close um, ex-boyfriend, uh, so it was domestic, and it was, they labeled it a victim of crime, is what I was. Okay, so take us into the hospital to when you noticed you weren't in this realm any longer. Right. Um, my experience did begin in the hospital. Um, 
I remember the ambulance and I remember being in the hospital and I remember the demons were immediately already there. Then the spiritual experience for me began just immediately. So let me ask, many speak about having an out-of-body experience, seeing themselves outside of their bodies or traveling through some sort of tunnel. But you did not transport over like this. You were immediately enveloped in otherworldly darkness with demonic figures. Yes, it felt like a void. And I say felt because at this point of my NDE, there was no vision. It was just black, um, such like a void. But I was aware, so um, my surroundings, I knew I was at the hospital, and I knew I was in a bed, and I knew I was alone, but obviously in a hospital, you're not going to be alone, and in the hospital, there's going to be light, but in my experience, it was darkness, and feeling, and just awareness, Um, no physical pain, no need to think of even wanting to move. It was just being in a different place already. Now, how did you determine that the entities you saw were demons? Okay, so after that point of the darkness, I, I, the awareness was stronger. So I did have sight and I can look around, but I still could not move. Um, at all. And when I say look around, I'm not even sure if it was with my physical eyes. Obviously, I was um, in a coma or whatever. I was in a surgery um, when the experience started. But I could see the room and I could see two figures. I'd like to point out also that the experience of time in this void was really overwhelming because it was like every or every talk was for literally forever and that's hard to explain a time difference with an experience because there's no such thing as a time difference but in my ND I did um, have that added to everything that I saw and everything that I felt was just the knowing of forever so in this room in this timeless zone um, of like forever blending with eternity, blending with now, blending with nowhere. Um, And then these demons were always there, and it was two of them. And they moved, you know, you can feel their presence. And um, when my vision got better, I should say, I can really make them out. They were men, two men. And one of them had a arm that was three swords that were his arm, he could move it, it was his weapon. And the other was a regular normal man's arm, but his hand was like a claw. So very like demonic, hellish, um, bald head, and his skin was white and very pale. Um, It, to me, was very real, and it was something that touched And when I touched it, because I ended up actually fighting with this demon that had the swords and the blades, and his mouth had um, many layers of razors, just um, he had no hair. And at one point, um, there was an erect penis at the very center of his forehead, which is very odd, but to a person fighting a demon such as this, there's no way to win. Um, the only thing I could elaborate on the fight was how long and exhausting it was, but I didn't ever stop. I always kept fighting him. And um, the fear that I had, um, I would say, didn't help me or it didn't set me back either. It was just there because I was very afraid. But I still, I fought him and I grabbed his swords regardless of if it would cut me. Um, and I just struggled as best I could. And at one point I was in a, like a hold where I was bound by him and he was sunk his teeth into the back of my head. And even then I didn't stop. I pushed my head back into him and kept fighting him regardless of 
my body. My will was always there. And at this point during the fight, um, he became blind. And the blindness enraged him. And he became like a crazy, blind, enraged demon, just, you know, a failure of some sort. And I could do nothing but lay there um, unable to move and just be in this place. Um, when I could look around, the room was like cement, um, heavy cement, dark gray, um, no experience of like being cold. I mean, I was laying there naked in a dungeon of sorts. And um, above me, there was long distance above me. It was like the end of the sewer system of the city. It just was like I was underground and the road was up there and there was a grate and on the other side of the grate were black souls, I guess, figures. Um, they were only black, like shadow, but dense. And they were just looking at me, all looking down at me and just staring at me. And then I turned my attention to another side of me, and it's the stairway of the cement steps going up. And they were big, just like the rest of the cement structures. So one step was just huge. And there was a small child, boy, coming down, walking down the steps. And there was a light coming from, like, his area. And the steps turned and bent up, but he would come down. He came down, and he had blonde hair, straight hair. He was like somebody. He had a face. He was a person. He looked at me, and I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking, help me. And he turns around and goes up. And then I feel uh, like helicopter. Like, I feel like worrying. I feel like movement. And, again, it's the void. It's just my darkness. And so I feel rushed up. And at this point, I guess I'm like, I've left because I begin a journey. And um, I'm still bound to my, what I thought in my mind is my body because I'm still not moving. There's no movement. Um, but I'm in places. So after the worrying feel and the rush, um, what I describe as like a helicopter. Um, so... Then I feel myself um, in different places in people's homes, um, laying on floors, um, being tended to, um, just feeling like they've cared for me, but I've left the hospital type. Still in the blackness, still in the void, still unaware of my surroundings, but just feeling of this. And um, the journey after that, after those places that I was feeling like I was in a home continued at one the next fleeting second it lasted half a second but it's just burned for forever in my mind is being suspended in the air not being able to move I'm completely afraid and around me I'm suspended in the middle of the air below me there's a raging ocean there's storm of clouds and thunder and lightning and rain and it's just a storm and in the water a form comes and it's the form of a man very strong you know and with a beard and curly hair I'll note his hair was curly everything about him was made of the water made of ocean I mean if anyone would think Poseidon but to me the feeling was that's him and he was swimming like the butterfly stroke. And like I said, the time of it was just half a fleeting second. And he's just in half a second of a stroke. And his attention turns to me. And I'm in the air still. And um, I'll say suspended like Jesus on the cross with my arms out and unable to move. And he sees me. And it's just pure overwhelming power. And that's it. And then I'm in another area. I'm actually in the spirit form in this vision. And I'm uh, flying 
as a spirit, I guess, very quick, very just with thought, I guess, and um, aware of where I was at, which was a place of blending colors and um, lots of colors that you would never be able to see, all different ones, just fading in everywhere. And I was seeing a desert out in front of me and mountains out in the distance. And on the desert, I see a road and a little motorcycle on the road. And so my spirit form is immediate interest. And I go up, and that takes like all of a, half a second, you know, what's half a second of half a second, and I'm there, and I see the motorcycle, and um, on the motorcycle, there's a dog, and it's a Springer Spaniel, and his ears are flapping in the wind, he's straight riding his motorcycle, and I'm up close to him as spirit form with all the colors and the intensity of just pure love, and just pure joy and peace and just happiness and this dog is riding a motorcycle so that lasted um a very quick point but again just burned into me for just forever yeah what you described here is a mouthful i mean i'm the host of this show but i'm left a bit speechless at the moment (laughs) Many questions come to mind, but first, let me ask, does this experience end after this point? Um, the experience actually, um, for those two were very intense and I relate to on a regular basis in my everyday life that I live and, um, the emotions that I try to keep with me. Um, so I, to say if the NDE ever ended, it's just, forever ongoing um but no the the imagery at this point i would have to continue another time because there's so many different things that i saw but they don't flow together so um another thing that i saw and i was completely awake and in the hospital and like aware of my wound and out of my coma and they had moved me up to the fourth level of the hospital out of the icu that first night out of the ICU, um, I saw out my window, standing on my own two feet, like a pure vision of war, like devastating, massive war of weapons I've never seen at that age before. And I was awake for that, but I experienced another spiritual, um, you know, moment where you're not your body, but you're like a spirit in the air and you're traveling in the time frame that is different. And um, I'm in this war as a spirit. And um, I can't remember like leaving my room or anything because I remember standing there and pulling the curtain and seeing this. And then I have memories of being um, there in spirit. Um, and so it, it's very hard, um, to have war imaging, um, that were that massive. I mean, there were ships and just powerful. I don't even know what they are, if they're cannons or what kind of weapons they were. Um, and I, I had another, um, anyway, that was just really hard to describe. So, well, let me go back and give you a break. You mentioned a lot there that, can be dissected going back to the demonic figures with the swords it's almost as if the earthly stabbing you received from your ex-boyfriend continued in this realm did anyone at any given time ever communicate with you no um i did receive some type of i guess words because it's not said what was said wasn't said with their mouth, but it did ring in my ears like for the rest of my life. Um, this was at some point after the battle with um, that demon. I was on a metal table and I had a gown on, like a hospital gown. And I'm sitting on the table with my legs over it. And it's just darkness around me, but one light from the middle as if someone had just turned a lamp on in a small room, just one little light. And there's a doctor there, I guess, you know, well, I'll tell you later. 
I did end up meeting him. Well, there's a doctor there, and he tells me, um, okay, now we're going to bring you back. But he says, you have to be good. And I remember thinking, well, I don't know if I can be good, but I, I guess I'll go back. And so I nodded my head. And he said that, you know, without moving his mouth. And I'm still thinking while I'm nodding my head, I don't know if I can do this, if I can be good if I go back. Um, and then anyway, at one point in ICU, very closely after I woke up from my coma, I mean, I had all kinds of tubes and breathing machine and everything attached to me. And um, one by one, they were taken out and he had come in and I said, are you the guy who did this to me? And I pointed at my stomach because I had an exploratory surgery, so I was just cut from here to there and um he said yes and I said thank you for saving my life and the only reason I thought it was him was because I, he was the one who told me to be good and he was going to bring me back and then he said yeah he did do that because when I was awake it was I was in Las Vegas Nevada at the UMC and there's a lot of students in fact my scar my exploratory surgery scar just shows the shaky hands of the students because it was not a clean cut. And so there was a lot of people working on me in this room coming and going. And for me to know that that guy was like, I don't know what you would call him in that world, like a teacher, the boss or whatever. He was the guy that oversaw everything. And so um it doesn't sound believable, but I still knew um, to some degree shown to me to be correct. So my next question is, you were taken from that demonic scene and you saw a child with a light accompanied with him. Do you believe that this light was the typical light that others see in a more heavenly experience? Um, I can say from my NDE, the light in the, I guess, dungeon or hell or basement or whatever you'd like to label that is not like a blinding love light. I did not feel anything from it. I just would note it. That's how I did see. And my love experience did come from the place in the desert with the image of the dog on the motorcycle. Had all different colors of lights all around me and the sun was setting and it was just completely surreal. Um, but there was no bright light. You also mentioned this Poseidon-like figure and feeling great power and awe from it. You said, it's him. Who do you suppose this was? To me, that was like it's him as in it's God. Um, like, because of course, when you're, <laughs> you can even imagine really being held there and suspended and being surrounded by the ocean and the storm and seeing that, of course, first thing you're going to say is, oh, my God, you know, and um, but it it was just like, oh, yeah, that was it's him. To me, that was my God. If someone said, what would God look like to you? Well, he's a man of waves. It makes absolutely no sense. I know I go to church and I, I believe in Jesus Christ and I've seen Andy Ears experiences on um, groups where they saw Jesus Christ or felt his presence or um, there is power and there is different forms, I guess. There's different types of religions and lots of different types of experiences. Um, but for me, yes, it was seeing him in, um, in the waves of the storm. And his voice was like a sound of many waters. Right. According to the book of Revelations, at least. So you may have a strong point there. Now, going into this desert scene and seeing this dog on a motorcycle and feeling this joy, did you lose a pet in the past at some point? Oh, of course. Was it this type of dog? No. Um, and although I would like to say uh, several years later, because I grew up away from my family, um, in the life that we had led, I was taken, and so um, it was very fast-paced and with a lot of people. And so 
when I was an adult and I was stabbed at 22 and I had um, kind of reconciled a little bit with some of the family in my past after that, I came to find out that my grandfather raised Springer Spaniel. That is why I asked, as you just stated, there may be a connection between this image and your grandfather. Uh, going into your after effects, you seem to have immediately awakened with some, as you mentioned, seeing war while looking out the window after being out of your coma. What type of after effects would you say you returned with in addition to this, if any? Yeah, um, some churches would definitely throw holy water on me. Um, <laughs> just saying. In fact, I was told that it's the work of the devil and, you know, you're not supposed to hear people thoughts and um i have a great connection with god um some people call it the source i have a great connection that provides me with answers to questions and it provides answers to why and it provides great direction on looking at different points this entity that appeared to you in the form of your doctor who said you could return so long as you are good. What do you believe he meant? I have no idea. It's been on the forefront of my mind for many years. Um, like, I struggled feeling like I was bad. Um, and so when he said you have to be good, well, of course, that you have to ask, well, what is good? Because I've met in my life a lot of people that some would call bad, bad people. But they're good. Spiritual growth is just a way of life, I guess. I know hellish near-death experiences are very difficult to talk about, and I'd like to ask, what would you say to those who may say hell does not exist? It's all a state of mind, as many on near-death experience group sites very often say. Well, I will say when I was in hell, and I called it hell, um, just from my own experience of my own words and not having people direct me. And I think that's why um, another reason of just keeping it to myself was because um, I was completely unaccepted. Sharing a story such as that, um, I had fear. I was a human. I sinned. Um, I, I went down paths that you're stuck in circumstance. And there is no movement in life, and you do suffer. I've walked through pain. It hurt so much, it killed me. And guess what? That's how you get stronger, and that's how you build yourself up. That's how you grow. So, yes, there's pain. There's hell. My conclusion is that we should be good. We do ripple on each other's. We can be greater. I am so much greater now than I was then. Absolutely, and in turn, that's what makes you invaluable. Alicia, I want to thank you for having the courage to share this type of near-death experience. I'm sure many will get answers they sought after, as well as perhaps relating to your resiliency. That sounds great. I hope so. Thank you. You're welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, Alicia Odell. And that's going to do it for me here on Real Spiritual Talk Radio. I am your host, Lamont Gates. Please be sure to visit my Facebook page, Real Spiritual Talk Radio. There you can find past shows as well as other related information. My YouTube page can also be found under my name, Lamont Gates. I want to thank you all for tuning in once again. For everybody who's listening, I hope that all are being spiritually enlightened, as I always am. And with that said... Real Spiritual Talk Radio is now signing off.